I'm Yara Bumulham in the Australian Outback, where drought-stricken wetlands are being reinvigorated. I'm Oliver Steeds on the west coast of Scotland, seeing how we can restore our fisheries. And I'm Russell Beard in Gloucestershire, England, where the future of the European eel depends on a lot more than just the tide. European eel numbers have diminished by over 90% in the last 30 years due to overfishing, habitat loss and man-made obstructions to their migratory pathways. I'm Russell Beard by the River Severn in Gloucestershire, England, where conservationists and fishermen are working together to secure the future of one of Europe's most enigmatic inhabitants. The European eel begins its life as a tiny leaf-like larvae in the North American Sargasso Sea. They're swept by the Gulf Stream towards European estuaries and river systems. Here they mature for up to 20 years before making the 4,000 mile return journey as a silver eel to reproduce. This process has never been witnessed by human eyes, giving the eel its reputation as one of our planet's most mysterious creatures. What are we waiting for here? The tide racing in, causing an enormous wave. This is what makes this river the only part of Britain where eels arrive in sufficient numbers. And that's, that's bringing in these juvenile eels? Yeah, well, they, they... they're locally called elvers. Elvers. The technical right. term at this stage is glass eels. Located in the southwest of England, the Bristol Channel is shaped like a giant funnel. During the highest tides, rising water is forced upstream into the Severn estuary, forming a large surge wave or tidal bore. No way, that's a proper wave. The ball we saw arriving came up the river. And you saw all that debris that yeah. it was carrying. Yeah. Well, it deposits it here. And this is exactly where the glass eels have been deposited. Within 15 feet of the ideal environment, there's no going back from this at the moment. So what's, what's going forward? The Environment Agency here in the UK has pioneered some, some, some new work creating eel passes when they climb through a tray of bristles mm -hmm. and they can go up and around. These eel passes are being installed, but with over 300 barriers on the River Severn alone, it's going to take a lot of time and money. Some, something that we're already doing, which is very significant, mm. is we're catching these glass eels from here, where they are abundant, to wetlands where they're not reaching mm. is part of the survival strategy of the European eel regulation. I mean, it's not what you think of generally, a fisherman catching fish in order to, to release them again. If you want to take fish and you want to enjoy it, you've got to do it in a sustainable way. Mm. We can't steal from the future anymore. So we come to meet Richard Cook. He runs the Severn and Wise Smokery. He's a lifelong fisherman, and he's going to talk to us about how fishing and conservation can go hand in hand. Conservation and glass eels is like, is like nothing else. Conserving cod stocks, con conserving haddock stocks, you know, the solution there is, is to stop fishing. Conserving glass eels is actually promote the British hand net fishery because that is the only vehicle that these fish have to get out of the river. Now, the fishermen and the collecting stations, they have signed up to a recovery plan which releases 45% of the glass eels back to restocking projects throughout Europe. Why are we fishing at night? I'm not doing this to torture you, yeah? The fish only move on nights. Here's a fishing vehicle, look. Oh, yeah. So, is there much in the way of competition with the other fish? Yeah. <laughs> the biggest man gets the best spot, you know? Right, so, right. That's kind of how it works still. Yeah. So what's my chances of getting a decent spot then? Uh, you're in trouble, mate, yeah. <laughs> uh, we're fortunate tonight, yeah, we've got a couple of guys that'll look after us tonight. Over the past sort of eight, ten years, it's dropped. But this year is showing really good signs. Oh, that's an unused. <laughs> that is quite a crazy sensation, look at that. You've got to say, you've got to teach them respect. They swam a long way to get here. So if I can not lose one over, mm. I'll be happy. All right, so what? what uh, Unlucky. Yeah. No, that's good. Go for it. Go for it. It's coming down, is it? Andy, the toy's on its way. It's got a bit of a head on it. Yeah, so get ready. 
The evening boar brings the glass eels, and as the tide recedes, they swim into the banks. Licensed fishermen stay out all night to catch as many as possible, which they can sell for 200 pounds a kilo. Yeah, we've got a few in here. Wow, that's that's a good haul. Well, just straight into this one. Straight into that bucket, yeah. The recognised statistic is that 95% of the glass eels that stay in this river will die in the first three months. Fish food? Absolutely. Yeah. Fish food, they get eaten with birds, other fish, mink. We're not conserving something beautiful to look at. It's not like a, a Buick swan or a flamingo, yeah? Yeah. You never see these things. This conservation is about conservation of a food. I know it sounds, it sounds crazy to eat the thing that we're worried about being extinct, yeah? However, if we eat the if we eat eel that's that's certified as sustainable, everybody all the way through the chain is restocking fish back to the wild, yeah. And yeah. it's not then dependent on a handout. Yeah. It's self-funded. Yeah, you got some. Go on, little ones. How many is there? Three. 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 Oh. Oh no, wait. There's one more. There's four. Get in there. I think that's the one, by the way. He's making it back to Sargasso. We know bits, yeah? So we know that the glass eels come in the spring. We know that the adult eels will leave in the autumn. We know that the fish will reside in the UK for 15 years. But we don't actually know whether they get back, yeah? We've never found the brood stock. But yeah. the knowledge that we do have, we ought to act on, mm. you know? We know the fish get stuck in here, yeah? So let's get them out of here and get them into the wetlands and get them onto the small ditches and dikes. That's something that we can do easily. So we've got a catch here and we've come to weigh them in. What have we got? Scales, boys. All right. Fruits of our labour. Yeah. 0.34. They're off onto the next stage of their journey. 68 quid. 68 quid. Split three ways. It's not bad. It's not too bad. After the fishermen get paid, their catch is transported to UK Glass Eels headquarters. And we come to meet this guy, Peter Wood. He's the kind of kingpin for the Elbering industry. So I think we contributed about half a kilo here, but clearly you've got a lot more than that. We're trying to get together four million pieces now to ship to Sweden. Peter Wood sells all his glass eels to fisheries and restocking projects across Europe. Every year we, we, we change something. We're always, always learning, controlling the pH and controlling the temperature. These, these glass eels will survive 36 hours in one of these boxes. So you think, are you positive about the future of the species? Oh, I think, yeah, very, very positive. Yeah. Restocking is, in the moment, the quick fix, because it's going to take a long time to uh, alter the, um, the flood defences and uh, the pumping systems in Holland and this sort of thing. We're never going to go back to a situation where it was as common it was 50 years, because I'm afraid you know, things have been altered. You know, we're living in a, a modern technological society now, and there is a small penalty to pay. After the short flight to Sweden, the glass eels are placed in strict quarantine to ensure they're safe for farming or redistribution. Twelve weeks later, we catch up with Richard Fordham at Scandinavian Silver Eel in Helsingborg. They've been farming and restocking eel in the region since 1984. It's amazing that you can see them gathering underneath the feeder. Call them uh, uh, dancing eels. Yeah, they look like kind of Moroccan cobras. <laughs> I'll get the waders. All right. I don't exactly know what we've got planned here. But here we got some larger ones. I don't like the idea of drowning in a vat of eels. 30% of the wild-caught elvers that arrive here are farmed to full size, destined for the dinner plate. Whoa! Round smoking. If the WWF say that this is on the critically endangered list, why should we not be putting all of these back in the river? Well, I think it's, uh, it's an important point that uh, there's an economic pressure to do things. If, if no one's eating eels, no one's uh, uh, being involved in the sense commercially involved, then there's a big risk that no funding will come. I mean, if uh, just conservationists are talking about eels, it's one thing. But if a whole spectrum of people have got an interest and want the eel to continue, then I think it has a much more secure future. 
Wow, they're very, really strong. Whoa! <laughs> Seventy percent of the imported elvers will be restocked in waterways and wetlands with access to the sea. And these are the same ones that we saw loaded up onto the plane 12 weeks ago. Yeah. Oh, you can see they're very different. With money from the Swedish government and match funding from the EU, Scandinavian silver eel manages to restock over two and a half million fish a year. We're going in this uh, bay here. It's very picturesque here, but um, in terms of eel habitat, this is much, much better place for them than, no, it, than no. it would be, say, no. in the River it's Severn. More or less every fish that we restock today, if you left them in the Severn, would have died. Do you think they will make it back to the Sargasso? Yes, I think so. You think so? Uh -huh. I think so. It's a long way. Yeah. <laughs> Energy and water companies responsible for the barriers to eel migration are also playing their part. When they abstract water, there are some eels that are uh, damaged. According to the rules and regulations, they must actually replace those fish. Okay. And then there's even more fish here than they will actually damage. Yeah, it just looks like an eel summer camp, doesn't it? It's absolutely uh -huh. perfect. Wow, OK, so we're going with the net. So Next stop, mm -hmm. the Sargasso, is it? Yeah. Wow, William good luck, years. little chaps. It would be a shame if such a common species would disappear. Yeah. But it has a complicated life cycle, and that's the problem. Whether you talk to a fisherman, a fish farmer, <laughs> a, uh, a biologist, a conservationist, people really want a, um, a future for the eel. Why are you coming out all this way to help with these eels? The Murray-Darling Basin in the southeast of Australia is home to the largest river system in the country. Many plant and animal species, a lot of them endangered, rely on this vast network of streams, creeks and rivers. But extensive diversion of water for irrigation combined with prolonged drought and overgrazing has left farmers with arid land, not suitable for agriculture. This is Dundamalli Station, a 3,000-acre property about nine hours' drive west of Sydney. It's owned by farmer Peter Morton, who's now returning a fifth of his property to wetlands. Who's going to jump in first? Me? Paker Lake spans two properties and is now part of a unique wetland system. But a year ago, it wasn't here. So, Peter, a year ago, this lake was empty. Yeah, 12 months ago, it was bone dry and had been dry for a hundred years. And we got together with the neighbours and, and put a committee together and with the help of the um, government bodies, we put 20,000 megalitres of water in. So how did you get the water back in? Paker Lake was separated from the river system by a <coughs> levee that was put in a um, hundred years ago. And this levee was a 20 kilometre flood bank that uh, was put along the high ground to stop the water from coming out here. Uh, because it was such a vast floodplain, they would cut the access off to the back country. Uh, and so that's why it was dry for 100 years? Yeah. Because of this why, historical levee? Yeah, historical levee put in 100 years ago when they had access problems and it goes back to the horse and buggy days, I guess. The resurgence in bird life has been really amazing. Did you expect this? Yeah, well, not to the extent that we had happened. There was probably 40,000 birds while it was filling and peaked out at probably around 80,000. How many bird species do you have here? We recorded 87 uh, total, uh, 35 of which are the wetland bird and five endangered species. Peter's helping their return by restoring native plant life. <laughs> 
Come here, Sal. Come on, mate. <laughs> you got the Sal. Righto, this is a team. These are the ligand plants we're going to put in. Yep. And we'll dig a little hole and put them in. Righto, mate. We'll get fair income here. We'll get a bit of mud on us. And we'll just go right around the edge, probably about two metres apart, I reckon, and we'll get them going. And then as it goes back a bit more, we might put another lot back in. OK. So what does this do for the environment? This is going to create the ideal habitat for uh, the wading bird to, to nest and hold a food source. And then how many years before uh, you know, it becomes a good habitat for the birds? Uh, providing they get sufficient water, uh, five years. It's barren land like this that Peter is reviving. So this is what you mean by clay pan, bare land? Yeah, well, that's what the Aussies call it. Um, clay pan country is usually um, pretty bare, scalded country, and uh, doesn't grow much normally. And now this is what it's like? Yeah, well, we planted these Phragmites here uh, three years ago, and, and within two years we had them seeding down, and they're going to be a terrific um, habitat for the birds and the, all the uh, aquatic species as well. How does this benefit you as a farmer? The economic benefits out of this is when we've got it fully restored, uh, to be a lot more grazing value to the land because there's no value at all because all the vegetation species were gone. That's because with the lake drained, the water table drops to the point where the surrounding land becomes arid. Letting the water back in raises the water table, allowing the land to support more plant life. As you can see here, the, the fodder there that will sustain a number of sheep. Before we didn't have that. It's just terrific to drive around and, and see the growth as it's happening. It'll be a forest of uh, box trees in 10 years' time, probably 20 feet high. Uh, there'll be uh, rookeries established through the Phragmites, I'd like to think. And um, yeah, it'll be, um, it'll be a picture then. So this is what Paker Lake once looked like. Yes, yeah, this is Hobbler's Lake, but Paker Lake is um, exactly the same as this. It's uh, saltbush vegetation with predominantly spear grass on the understory. And yeah, we're working on doing a um, project with a neighbour and making a vegetation plan out of this to restore this to its original shape as well. So are you an environmentalist or are you a farmer? I'm a both um, environmentalist and a farmer, but um, also with a keen duck shooter and but I think I'm putting more birds back on the planet now than I shot. current rates of decline, scientists predict our seas could be without fish within 40 years. With 1 billion people eating fish as their primary source of animal protein, and over 200 million dependent on fish as their only livelihood, that could mean a humanitarian disaster. I'm Oliver Steeds on the west coast of Scotland, investigating how we can restore our collapsing fisheries and our ocean's health. This is Scotland's first fully protected marine reserve, one of only three in the whole of the United Kingdom. It was established in 2008 in Lamlish Bay on the Firth of Clyde, after a decade of campaigning by a voluntary community-led organisation called Coast, the Community of Arran Seabed Trust. Howard, what's the plan today? Well, the plan is that uh, this morning we're going to take you for a dive within the no-take zone. What are the key things we're going to look at? The a more complex seabed, so that basically after three years of no fishing, no extraction of any form, no dredging of the seabed, we're starting to see the kind of shoots of, of life coming from it, from in both the uh, uh, seaweeds, macroalgae, to lots of uh, animals like hydroids and bryozoans and soft corals and sponges, hopefully. The goal of the no-take zone is to help regenerate the local marine environment and enhance commercial shellfish and fish populations. We've got lots of different things, including this. This is an argon mask. I'm just going to have a microphone in so Howard can uh, talk to us. There you go. Good luck. At first, the bottom looks like a desert 
caused by scallop dredging and trawling, which plow up the seabed, hoovering up everything in their path. But then, a few signs of regeneration. Most of the growth you see on this little boulder here are hydroids. So they come in many shapes and forms. And what we've seen over the last three years is that the rocks and boulders in certain areas are helping with the, the spread of all these different species and all these animals out across into the sand and gravel substrate. So you can see the complexity of the seabed here. It's really just covered in hydroids and red algae that, that provides habitats for a huge array of fish, shellfish, young eggs. And then one of the most beautiful sights, a free swimming scallop. Over the last two to three years of protection is the scallop numbers have increased, not only in numbers, but the size of the scallops within the no-take zone. In a spot close to the shore that has always been naturally protected from trawlers and dredgers, Howard shows us what the seabed should look like. Here we've got a little velvet crab. If you look just over that boulder, Oliver. Here we've got a nice, large, spiny starfish. Here we've got a pink cushion star. At 10 metres, we started to edge into the kelp forest. And in amongst it, there's all kinds of brown, filamentous algae, seaweeds, that uh, create lots of three-dimensional space for literally hundreds and thousands of both small and large creatures, all very, very important and then both in the food chain and the complexity of, of the marine environment. So that's a healthy environment? That's getting healthier. Yeah, yeah. Just needs a few more years and an odd decade will help it greatly. Howard and his colleagues are not stopping with the no-take zone. They're also proposing a marine protection area, 100 times bigger, but still only 8% of the Clyde. What's the difference between the no-take zone and the proposed marine protected area? The difference is that in the no-take zone, there's no extraction of any marine life at all. The marine protected area, uh, certain forms of fishing like creeling and, and uh, angling and scallop diving would continue, uh, but the forms of uh, fishing like scallop dredging, bottom uh, trawling uh, would be prohibited. That's our proposal. What will be the benefit to the fishing community? There are many, many benefits to the fishing community, both in the short term and the long term. It contains two really important spawning areas for herring. The overspill from these areas mean that they're, uh, they'll be getting better catches, and hopefully, within five or 10 years, they may be able to actually start fishing fish. You can remember in the Clyde, all well, we've got left to fish are prawns and scallop. And how many more jobs will that create? Well, the potential, I think, in the Clyde, um, even going back on figures from 20, 30 years ago, you know, three, up to 300 people were employed in it. David Curry is one of the local scallop fishermen and mussel farmers. I'll take you out now. That's not a problem. A good day for it. What do you think of the no-take zone? Yeah, uh, yeah, very good. I mean, um, what uh, Don McNeish and Howard done there together, it was is really good. Would you support the marine protected area? If a farmer stops ploughing his fields, the fields will start growing naturally into whatever they want to do, so it's, it's basically it makes sense. And that'll give juvenile fish right round the area plenty more ground to, to, you know, to grow, you know. In fact, biomass increases of over 400% have been documented within marine reserves. And if key breeding grounds are protected, fish stocks recover. Good news for fishermen in surrounding areas. But scientists now believe that if we are to restore the health of the oceans, we need to protect at least 25% of them. Today, a little over 1% are protected. The biggest stumbling block, not just in Scotland, but in the UK, in fact, probably the whole world, 
is the complete lack of political will. The, the short-termism of politicians and, and fisheries ministers is, to be honest, absolutely unbelievable uh, because the economics of marine protected areas uh, are well proven. Uh, we just need to look to the future and future generations, future fishermen. These, th these things are proven, they work. So start right here, right the start right here with me. Right to the bottom. Right to the bottom, one, two, three, let's go. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs>